however, they're not without their problems. Often to get these things working, uh, one has to do a lot of intervention. And so uh, to address some of these issues, we proposed a, a Bayesian formulation for learning in generative adversarial networks, which requires very little uh, human intervention and also provides some really exciting results for semi-supervised learning problems. In particular, we found with this Bayesian GAN model, we've been able to achieve state-of-the-art predictive accuracy on several major classification benchmarks using uh, less than 1% of the labeled training examples. And I think in general, this is an exciting direction for generative adversarial networks and some of these deep generative models uh, that have been coming out of the deep learning community like variational autoencoders. It's a nice way to quantify how well these models are working and it's also a nice sort of practical thing we can do with these models besides, say, image generation. Um, in order to make a, a lot of this work, we used a, a new type of uh, stochastic MCMC procedure called stochastic <laughs> gradient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, this is something that I think is very exciting even beyond Bayesian GANs. I think it's exciting in the context of doing Bayesian deep learning. I think uh, there's really a lot of promise for Bayesian methods uh, 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 in uh, doing inference with deep neural networks. Often the uh, likelihood functions are not very well specified for these models. They contain a lot of broad local optima, such that even if we have a very vague prior, uh, if we do Bayesian marginalization, we'll get a very, very different answer than we would if we were to do maximum likelihood estimation relative to what we might see if we were to apply some of these inference procedures to other classes of models. Uh, of course, also, um, uh, following a Bayesian approach will give us natural uncertainty estimates and allow us to, um, uh, for example, make good decisions uh, in autonomous vehicles and other sorts of problems. So uh, I think in the last few years, algorithmic advances like stochastic MCMC and stochastic gradient HMC in particular will allow us to use uh, Bayesian approaches in deep learning without a lot of additional computational overhead, whereas many of these approaches would have been entirely intractable, say, pre-2014. And we'll, we'll go into that a little bit later. Uh, my main goal in this talk, actually, is to have you understand this figure that we have on the first slide here. So this is something we'll be coming back to shortly. Um, before we get into the details, though, I'll start with a, a little bit more motivation. Um, at a high level, uh, an ambition of machine learning is to build intelligent agents which can learn and make decisions without human intervention. And a lot of the learning that we do comes without labels. So it, it seems that uh, unsupervised learning should be a foundational aspect of this ambition. More specifically, um, we can use a lot of these deep generative unsupervised models for a lot of practical applications such as simulating possible futures and reinforcement learning semi-supervised learning, um, something I'll come back to shortly, and image super resolution, in painting, and all sorts of uh, types of extrapolation. Uh, GANs and variational autoencoders, another family of, of deep generative models, have recently emerged as very powerful frameworks for generative unsupervised modeling, allowing us to, to really make a lot of progress on problems that seem quite untractable using the methods that were being applied previously. Um, I got interested in GANs after Jan LeCun visited Cornell and proclaimed that they were the most significant new development in machine learning in the last 10 years. Uh, I don't know whether this is a, you know, a true proposition, but uh, it was enough for me to read the paper, and I think they are really exciting models. So what are GANs? Um, at a high level, as I've mentioned, GANs implicitly perform density estimation. A generator G will propose samples from a data distribution, attempting to fool what's called a discriminator D, and learning takes place through an adversarial game between the generator G and the discriminator D. GANs are particularly good at learning to sample from distributions over images, which has been a challenging problem historically. Now, before we get into the details of GANs, let's first consider a more classical approach to density estimation. So let's suppose we have a bunch of observations, Y1 up to Yn, which have been drawn from some unknown density, Py, we want to estimate this density. So we'll specify an observation model. For example, we could assume that the points were drawn from a mixture of Gaussians. And our goal then is to learn the parameters of this mixture of theta. So the weights, here we just have a mixture of two different Gaussians, uh, the means, mu1 and mu2, and the variances, sigma1 squared and sigma2 squared. And we can do that by uh, forming a likelihood from our observation model, and for instance, maximizing that likelihood with respect to these parameters. Um, as we all know, sometimes this can lead to undesirable results. For example, if we have a mixture of two Gaussians here, we can have one of the Gaussians giving mass to all of the points, 
and then the other Gaussian is free to collapse its mass onto one of the points to achieve infinite likelihood, but not a generalizable density estimate. We wouldn't actually believe that our data were generated by point masses, for instance. Now we can uh, remedy this problem by having a, a regularizer, which will go to zero faster than the likelihood will go to infinity for pathological settings of these parameters, for instance, having the variance parameters going to zero. Um, or we could uh, follow a fully Bayesian approach where we do Bayesian marginalization and we have our density estimate, y star given some setting of these parameters, weighted by uh, the posterior probability of these parameters given the data of both y. So then we're, we're doing a, a Bayesian model average over an uncountably infinite set of solutions. And in fact, um, in the Bayesian formulation, we can use extremely flexible density esti estimation models, even infinite mixtures of Gaussians. You may heard of Dirichlet process mixture models in conjunction with quite vague priors. And in fact, it's, it's okay from this perspective for some of the solutions to be point masses, as long as those are uh, a small number of solutions in an uncountably infinite set of solutions and they don't have 100% uh, you know, posterior probability. And uh, since uh, mixtures of Gaussians are dense in the set of distributions, uh, this means this will also be a very flexible approach to density estimation. Okay, so um, generative adversarial networks approach this problem by first defining a procedure for sampling from some distribution of interest. We start by sampling a number of variables, z1 up to zn, uh, from some distribution pz. Typically, this is a vague sort of noise distribution, like a uniform distribution or a broad Gaussian distribution. We then transform these samples through a generator g, which has parameters theta g, to obtain samples x, and these samples are in the space of uh, 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 the, the, the distribution that we're trying to model. Um, G can be uh, you know, an arbitrary function, uh, but typically it's chosen to be a neural network, and theta G are the weights of the neural network. If uh, G has sufficient capacity, then there'll be some setting of its parameters theta G such that uh, this function can approximate the right CDF inverse CDF composition uh, in order to sample from a distribution of interest. So, uh, we can think of inverse uniform sampling, for instance, where we start with samples from a uniform distribution, we pass them through some uh, uh, inverse CDF of interest in order to sample from that other distribution. Uh, or we can start with uh, variables that might have, uh, say, a gamma distribution, pass them through a gamma CDF, make them uniform, and then pass those samples through some, some inverse CDF. So, um, you know, if the neural network is, is flexible enough, or whatever G is, is flexible enough, it should be able to approximate those kinds of compositions to sample from some distribution of interest. So this slide is actually primarily the set of the notation we'll be using throughout the talk. Here we have our G, the generator, theta G, the parameters that we're trying to learn, uh, Z, uh, noise variable, and X is a sample in the data space. Visually, we start with noise, we pass it through a generator, we'll get, for instance, an image. Now, in practice, I said that G is typically chosen to be a neural network, and in fact, we often use what's called a deconvolutional neural network. It's sort of like an inverted convolutional neural network. You start with some relatively low dimensional vector Z here. You're 100 dimensional, you pass it through several layers, and um, you get a high dimensional image. Um, so in a little bit more detail, uh, we have the generator proposing candidate data samples, and we now want to learn these parameters theta g so that we're sampling from uh, something close to the data distribution that we want to model. Uh, so we have this other model, a discriminator, which will have access to uh, a data set which is presumed to have been drawn from this distribution of interest. Uh, we can assume, for example, that it's a collection of photographs or a collection of images. Um, the discriminator uh, trains its parameters theta d to try to classify samples from the generator and differentiate them from samples from the actual data distribution. So actually D is a pretty vanilla binary classifier. Uh, we'll have uh, training data points, which will give one label, and we'll have data points which have come from the generator, which have a different label, and the discriminator is just a simple classifier, uh, typically also a convolutional neural network, um, which is trying to learn um, the difference between these samples. So the generator will update its parameters theta G to fool the discriminator. The discriminator will update its parameters theta D to get better at calling out samples from the generator, and we can show, and we will in a moment, that if G and D have sufficient capacity, then samples from G will converge to samples from the actual data distribution, 
Um, and in practice, um, this procedure doesn't work so much because G and D are flexible. I argued that if G was flexible enough, then it could approximate some kind of composition that would you know, allow you to, to uh, sample from a data distribution of interest. That's, that's true, but what really makes this, this, this approach uh, work well is the, are the inductive biases of these models. So I said G and D could be any model, but in practice, and I don't just mean 99% of the time, I mean 100 minus epsilon percent of the time, these models are, are, are convolutional neural networks. And those neural networks have a lot of inductive biases which have been baked into the architecture in order to be good at modeling images. We actually said earlier that um, we could use a, a, a mixture of Gaussians as a density estimation model, and that that model would have enough flexibility if we had sufficiently many components to model any kind of distribution. But if we were to use a mixture of Gaussians to model images, for example, we wouldn't have very good inductive biases. We would have the flexibility, but not the biases. Um, the biases that kind of model might have, for instance, is that uh, you know, images are close together if they're close in uh, the Euclidean distance of uh, vectors of pixel intensities, which we know isn't a very good assumption. It wouldn't accommodate, for example, translations or rotations. Can you just, yes. what's really exactly inductive bias? Uh, what is an inductive bias? Yeah, how did you find um, so, uh, from a Bayesian perspective, uh, I would talk about, so there's sort of two key concepts in generalization. One is support, what kinds of data sets we can generate from our prior, and the inductive bias would be the, the distribution of that support. So we could imagine on a vertical axis here, we have uh, the evidence, the probability of a data set, the density of a data set given a model, and on the horizontal axis, in one dimension here, we have every possible data set. And so a model with wide support would be able to generate quite a large number of different data sets. Uh, a model with inductive biases would um, concentrate some of that support around various solutions a priori. And so we could imagine, for example, that this model here is like a fully connected multi-layer perceptron. And here we might have a convolutional neural network. And uh, a convolutional neural network is actually less general than, than a fully connected neural network. It has various constraints. But um, these data sets here, for example, could correspond to images. So uh, another way of putting it is, for example, if our generator is this inverted convolutional neural network, on average, the types of images that we would get out of that generator starting from a vague noise distribution would look more like the data we're trying to model than if we were to use a fully connected neural network. And so here's a visualization of the training procedure. Here we have uh, our um, data distribution shown by the black dots. This is what we're trying to estimate. We have uh, the sort of implicit uh, generator distribution in green. And in blue, we have the output of the discriminator. We start by sampling from our uniform distribution in Z space here. We pass those samples through the generator. They concentrate in the right corner of this plot here because most of the mass of the generator is over here initially. The discriminator is very quickly uh, uh, able to call out those samples because this mass is actually uh, pretty far away from the mass of the distribution that we actually want to model. Um, this sends a signal back to the generator to update its parameters to shift its mass closer to the actual data distribution. The discriminator will then continue to update until eventually uh, the generator will be exactly modeling the data distribution. The discriminator will be confused. It's just outputting a half each time. It can't, can't differentiate between the two. Now, this is the exact objective that's been used for training GANs that was proposed in the classical GAN paper of 2014. Um, it's a minimax objective. Uh, we want to maximize this expression with respect to D in training the, the discriminator. Uh, so uh, the discriminator wants um, inputs that actually come from the, the data distribution uh, to have outputs close to 1. Uh, you, can, you can perceive the outputs of D to be the probability that its input comes from the data distribution. On the other hand, the generator wants to fool the discriminator into thinking that its outputs are real, so the generator wants to maximize this expression, or uh, sorry, maximize this expression, or minimize the whole expression here. And the discriminator wants to say that uh, uh, samples from the generator uh, uh, didn't come from the data distribution, so it wants to maximize this expression by minimizing this expression. Yes. Um, so there are various ways to actually derive this, this loss function, um, and we'll, we'll get into that uh, a bit later, but um, this was just what was proposed. It looks a bit like sort of a Bernoulli kind of loss. 
you, you might expect there to be a bit of an imbalance if you were to weight them differently, depending on how many samples you have from this, this uh, P set as well. Any other questions for the objective? Yeah. So, so when should we be interested in the generator? Um, it's a very good question. Typically, yes. Actually, in this talk, we'll mostly be interested in the discriminator for semi-supervised learning. But uh, in principle, we want the generator to be producing samples which come from some data distribution that we want to model. Mm -hmm. um, any more questions about this training objective? This is really what was new about the classical GAN paper. Rather than doing explicit, say, maximum likelihood density estimation, it's proposing this adversarial game where you have some, some discriminator, which is... Um, uh, uh, giving feedback to the generator as part of the training procedure. Mm -hmm. So where are the labels here? Um, so the labels, yeah, I'll, I'll actually answer that in the next slide. <laughs> Good question. Um, or in a couple slides. Okay, so we can take this objective and uh, fix the, the generator and see what we get for the optimal discriminator. In this case, that will just be the density of the data over the sum of the data and generator densities. Uh, we can show this actually quite easily by transforming this expression, changing the expectations into integrals, um, and then doing a change of variables, where if we have uh, uh, samples z from p of z, and we pass those through g, then we get samples in x space. And then we can optimize the argument of this integral. So we could uh, rewrite this, for example, as a log y plus b log 1 minus y, where a is p data and uh, b is p generator and y is d of x. And this is just a simple convex function which achieves its maximum at a over a plus b, or p data over p data plus p generator. We can then substitute that expression into our cost function to get the resulting cost function in terms of the generator. So here, uh, we're actually optimizing with respect directly to the, with, with respect to the generator and discriminator, not with respect to the generator and discriminator parameters. Um, when we do that um, and uh, do a little bit of algebra, we get a constant plus uh, what's called the Jensen-Shannon divergence between the data distribution and the generator distribution. And that will have uh, its minimum of, of zero when the generator distribution is equal to the data distribution. Now, in the last year or so, there's been a lot of work in replacing this Jensen-Shannon divergence with other kinds of um, distance metrics between probability distributions, for example, like a Wasserstein divergence for robustness. Um, and uh, we can imagine that if our models didn't have infinite capacity uh, and didn't have the right biases, that this could be really important. For example, if we had instead had a KL divergence here between the generator distribution and the data distribution, uh, that would have some zero forcing properties that would um, generally give us overly compact representations of the data. So, for example, our samples of images might not have uh, a lot of variability. Yeah. No, Mr. Kiska, I sure. think for the, for the fact that the discriminator is convolutional network is important because it has the right biases. It shouldn't have, it shouldn't like be used the discriminator freely to be able to get the Jensen Shannon uh, divergence, right? You shouldn't be able to use the discriminator freely. No, like, isn't it really important that the discriminator is a convolutional CNN? It is. So this okay. is sort of in the idealized case where D and G have um, uh, uh, infinite capacity and we have infinite data. Yep. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by capacity of network? Is that the approximation property of the network? Um, uh, yes, exactly. So uh, 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 what kinds of functions can it, can it model? That's what you call capacity. Yeah. yeah. Good question. And this is the, the track, uh, sort of the practical stochastic gradient algorithm that's used to train GAN. So there is a question about what are the training data. And this is basically where the training data comes in. So in order to train this model in practice, we take a mini batch of M noise samples Z up to ZM from our noise prior. So this is just a simple, say, uniform distribution. We then take a sample mini batch of M examples from our training data set. So this could be just a collection of images, for example, uh, presumed to have been drawn from the distribution that we want to model. Um, so this would be like our training data. Uh, and then we update the discriminator by sending its stochastic gradient on this cost function here. Uh, so we're trying to learn its parameters theta d. So this is just like a binary classification. And then we sample a mini batch of M noise samples, again, from the noise prior. And then we update the generator by sending its stochastic gradient on this cost function here. So the generator is trying to make the discriminator, discriminator think that its samples come from the, the right data distribution. And in fact, um, the original paper uh, 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 had a kind of a fun analogy where you could 
perceive the generator to be like a gang trying to produce counterfeit currency, and the discriminator like the police, which are you know, trying to call out the fakes. And uh, you know, through, through feedback from the police, the, the, the gang gets better at producing counterfeits, the police get better at calling out counterfeits, until eventually the, the gang is actually <laughs> generating actual <coughs> currency. So these were the results from the original GAN paper. Uh, here we have um, samples of handwritten digits. The training data in this case was the MNIST repository, so a bunch of different handwritten digits. In the far right column here, we have the closest examples from the training set to try and show that the model isn't just memorizing the training set. Um, here we have results from a bunch of other different data sets, uh, celebrity faces, <coughs> SIFAR, and um, I know to now, now these results are kind of laughable, but at the time, these sort of colored blobs were extraordinary progress. Like this was much better than what the other models were doing, and also it was achieving these results uh, uh, you know, much more easily than say stacked RBMs and all these other models that people were using for image generation. So this was sort of enough to um, uh, really excite the community and generate a lot of follow-up work. Um, now, um, uh, one of the more sort of prominent follow-ups is this DC GAN model, and it demonstrates you know, really the importance of inductive biases. In fact, in the original uh, GAN paper, they did use fully connected neural networks to generate these images. In the DC GAN, they use more convolutional neural networks, and the results are really much better. Um, you may have noticed if you read some GAN papers that often the samples are in these tiny little sort of tiles. They're a little bit hard to sort of, you know, look sort of reasonable, but you know, could there, some, could there be something funny going on here? And in fact, high resolution sampling has been a real challenge with these models, but it also appears to be something that's been solved recently with this progressive GAN model, which just appeared on Archive a, a few weeks ago. And uh, it, you know these samples are really remarkable. These 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 images are, are entirely fictional, but, but quite remarkably realistic. <laughs> in the modern iterations of GANs, and when they get to, do, I don't know how how do they train to a full equilibrium? But what does the discriminator look like at the end? Is it in the equilibrium? Um, so it's class? usually a little bit above sort of fifty percent for most of the samples. Yes, yeah, so about sixty-five percent or so. Uh, in in principle, it should be outputting about a half once training is converged. And to decide whether it's converged, they just look at you know how much has changed, I guess, since the last iteration and have a threshold. Mm -hmm. When you say these are fictional, you mean like those aren't real people? No, no, these are entirely fictional. Uh, so it's 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 really quite incredible. Like uh, uh, you know, this was the state of the art a few years ago. These faces, and we we've, we've gone from that to these images. Um, uh, so it's it's really quite incredible, and most of this progress uh, has happened through better inductive biases. Uh, so, you know, the models that we were using a few years ago were more flexible than the models that, that, that produced these images. How and big was the data for this? How big? Uh, I think about 100,000. So all like friends and portraits? So these are, uh, uh, yeah, uh, portraits of, of, of various celebrities. Uh, but yeah, these are, don't actually look like anything in the trading set. So it's very high quality, good lighting, good lighting type of photos? Um, yeah, they would be fairly good high-resolution photos, yeah. Um, but had we trained um, the classical GAN on, say, these images, we would get an output that looks more like this. So about the inductive biases, just like in between the corner, so I thought, so the, the generator needs to have really good inductive biases. Does the discriminator too? Because people use these, like, W-GANs, and they don't have an inductive bias on the discriminator. It's true, yeah. So the the dis like convolutional neural, like pretty vanilla convolutional networks, are, are really good at image classification already. So I feel like a lot more, like the, the generator is a lot more challenging than the discriminator. Uh, in fact, usually the problem is the discriminator is too good for the generator. So uh, one thing also I've noticed in, in a lot of GAN papers is the discriminators that they are using are are sort of 2014 era kind of convolutional neural networks rather than deep residual networks or dense nets. And that's because if you try to use a dense net, it will just totally crush the generator and it, nothing will be learned. Uh, we can also do these you know, parlor tricks that we could do with word embedding, uh, where we might start with a bunch of images of, say, men with glasses. And then we could try to find the, the z vector, the average z vector that would correspond to these images. Then we could subtract the average z vector corresponding to images of men at the z-vector for women, and then sample from small perturbations about that, and we would roughly get images of, of women with glasses. So there's actually some linear structure that's been learned in this latent z-space after training. How do you find the z-vector? 
Yeah, so that's a good question. It's been done in various different ways. The most popular approach is actually to train another neural network, which will go backwards into the Zen system. Um, we could also linearly interpolate between coordinates and... Uh, There's a saying in deep learning that the solution to every problem in deep learning is really <laughs> <laughs> uh, Just like I wrote it. Um, so... Uh, uh, yeah, you can linearly interpolate between coordinates in, in this set space as well, and you'll get different digits, and this is kind of cool because this is done in a completely unsupervised way. It's not like we have some other variable that's saying this is a 2 or this is a 9. You know, there's just some linear structure that's been learned in this model, which again isn't too surprising because if you look at, say, like a deep conf net for image classification, the last layer is basically a linear classifier. So the assumption of this model is we can do a bunch of transformations such that in the end we have a linearly separable problem. We can also combine these models with language models. So here we have descriptions and corresponding samples from a generator. Uh, I think this is quite exciting because if you were to type some of these descriptions into, say, Google Image, you might actually get pictures that look like this. But these, these aren't real photographs of birds. These are entirely fictional. These have just been sampled from the generator. Um, on the other hand, we might be a bit confused if we were to enter these descriptions in the bottom row and get these types of results for the flowers, so this white and yellow flower. Uh, uh, these, these white and yellow flowers have thin white petals and a round yellow stamen. Um, if we were to get th these kinds of pictures, why might you be a, a little bit unhappy? What seems wrong with those samples? Exactly. So this is an example of a common pathology in GANs called mode claps, where uh, the generator basically collapses a lot of its mass onto a particular region to please the discriminator and really not solve the problem that we want to solve. Uh, here we have another example where the generator is cycling between different modes in a multimodal distribution at various training iterations, but uh, uh, at any given training iteration, it isn't sampling from the full multimodal distribution. Now, um, we can gain some insight into mode clap by actually imagining that we, we switch the order of the, the min and the max. Um, in that case, uh, the, uh, the generator is incentivized just to find the one example that pleases the discriminator most and, and, and end there. Uh, in the gang analogy, we could imagine that maybe the gang gets lucky and produces one good-looking $5 bill and the police is, is very happy. Um, and then the gang responds to that by learning only to produce $5 bills rather than sort of generating samples from a whole distribution over currency. Um, in order to address these kinds of stability issues, uh, uh, practitioners often use what's called feature matching, uh, trying to have the model uh, not just use the regular GAN objective, but also have samples from the generator, for example, matching the, the moments of the, the training set, which is reminiscent of ABC, approximate Bayesian computation, a much, much older approach uh, to generation. Uh, Mini-batch discrimination, where the discriminator isn't just acting on single samples, but is actually operating on sequences of, of samples. So uh, we can imagine, for example, that we wanted to model uh, a standard normal distribution. And if I were proposing samples to you, and I proposed a sample of zero, you couldn't say, no, that's a terrible sample. In fact, it's the most probable sample from that distribution. But if I proposed a sequence of zeros, you would say, of course, that's that th th those aren't samples from the distribution that you want to model. That's impossible unless the, the distribution has had no bearing. <coughs> um, the gang analogy, you know, it, it could be like, you know, if you were only producing $5 bills, if you were to just open a random wallet and there were a million $5 bills, that could be quite confusing. Um, you could also do label smoothing, so you can have the discriminator saturate and say um, something greater than zero and, and less than than one uh, to reduce the seeming kind of overfitting effect. And in fact, um, we thought that this effect was, was somewhat reminiscent of what happens when you do maximum likelihood density estimation with mixtures of Gaussians and you have the components collapsing onto individual training points and effectively memorizing the data set. So this got us thinking about how we could follow a, a Bayesian approach to trying to update our posterior beliefs in response to adversarial feedback. And um, uh, the first part is actually quite simple. We just place a, a distribution over the generator parameters and the discriminator parameters, and this will induce a distribution over generators and a distribution over discriminators. So uh, to, to generate samples from these models, we would first uh, just uh, sample from our distribution over the generator parameters, given whatever hyperparameters it might have, say alpha g. 
just uh, for simplicity, we can imagine we have, say, a Gaussian distribution over theta g, and maybe a scaled identity matrix as a covariance matrix, and it could be scaled by alpha g. Um, so we get a sample from this distribution of the generator parameters. Then, as before, we'll sample z1 up to zn from this noise distribution. With our sample from the generator parameters, we can then define a generator. We have some neural network architecture. It's parameterized by theta g, and we now have values for theta g that have been sampled from this, this prior. Uh, we can then use this architecture to generate samples in the data space. Um, and we have sort of samples from, our, from our, our Bayesian generative adversarial network. Now, the next challenge, and I'll come back to this, this figure shortly, uh, is to update our posterior distribution uh, for each of these parameters, the generator weights and the discriminator weights. And to start thinking about that, we could do a, a little thought experiment where we could imagine initially we have quite vague beliefs about these parameters, so we don't have a preference for any particular setting of the generator weights, and we'll just sample something from this distribution. So let's say we sample from that, and we get theta g prime. We then create our generator with those weights. We then sample a bunch from this set distribution <coughs> to produce some images. And then we have a discriminator, and it's going to give us some feedback. So suppose it says, we really don't like those images. This is a, these are really bad samples from the data distribution. Then we ought to respond to that by updating our posterior beliefs about the generator parameters, such that we have a dip in probability in the region of parameters that we sample. And because this is a proper normalizable distribution, we'll have relatively more, more probability for some of the other settings of the parameters. We could then repeat this procedure. We sample again from this now updated distribution over the generator weights. Suppose we sample over here, theta g double prime. Then we create our generator with that setting of the parameters. And now suppose the discriminator loves those images that we're generating. Then again, we should update our posterior beliefs so we have an increase in probability around um, that setting of the generator weights. And in fact, what I'm describing here is basically using the discriminator as um, a link function to produce a likelihood. Just like we choose a logistic sigmoid in logistic regression um, as a link function to produce a likelihood there, where we could have chosen a probit or something else, we can actually just use the discriminator straightforwardly as a link function to produce a likelihood in order to update the generator parameters. So here we're writing down the conditional posterior of the generator parameters, given the noise z and the discriminator parameters theta d. Here we have our likelihood expression. So if G is outputting images that really please the discriminator, then that will send a positive likelihood signal for that setting of the generator parameters. And over here, we just have the prior <coughs> of the generator parameters. In the next equation here, we have the conditional posterior over the discriminator weights, given both the, the noise samples, Z, the training data set, capital X, so some collection of images we assume to have been drawn from the distribution we want to model, and the generator parameters, theta g. Now here we just have a, a vanilla binary classification likelihood. And here we again have the, the discriminator, uh, the, the prior with the discriminator weights. Now this actually goes a bit deeper than just using the discriminator as a link function. Um, if we use a vague prior over the discriminator and generator parameters and, per, and do iterative map optimization instead of um, posterior sampling, will actually recover exactly the classical GAN algorithm. Um, so if we take in the log posteriors, uh, had a big prior so that these just become scaling constants, and done iterative map optimization, we would get exactly the same local optima that we would in the classical GAN training procedure. So in that sense, this is a natural Bayesian generalization of the classical GAN algorithm. Now what we do is to actually sample from these conditional posteriors, and I'll argue shortly that this will actually make a big difference even if we have a very uninformative vague prior over the uh, generator and discriminator rates. Um, now we're being Bayesian, so we want to marginalize more variables. We can also marginalize these, these z variables by straightforwardly following the, the sum of the product rules. So here we have uh, the uh, unconditional distribution of theta g given theta d. We can marginalize out uh, z here just by uh, expanding the joint distribution over theta g and z into a product of conditionals, and fortunately z is conditionally independent of theta d, and we can then approximate this integral just by simple Monte Carlo sampling, and 
Fortunately, it's very easy to, to, and cheap to obtain samples from P, PZ. Uh, that's just, for example, a uniform distribution or a big Gaussian distribution. And in fact, uh, this procedure converges very, very quickly because of the way that these models have been specified. Um, if we view uh, this conditional distribution, theta g given z and theta d, as a function of, of z, it's actually quite broad. And so each of the samples that we get from pz will contribute a reasonable amount to this estimation. And we'll find something that works pretty well very quickly. Um, we can do the same thing for theta d given theta g. Uh, here it's more of an approximation because, of course, um, the values of z do depend on um, uh, uh, the, the, the data. Uh, and we could, we could uh, consider an extreme case where we just have a single training point. There's almost a unique value of z that'll give us that, that point. Uh, however, if our mini batch of training data points x is large enough, then it's still a reasonable approximation. Okay, so um, we were most excited about developing this uh, approach to learning in generative adversarial networks for uh, semi-supervised classification problems. So here in the top figure, we just have a sample from uh, each of two classes. Uh, so two data points, one from each class, uh, with this white dot here and this black dot here. And because we don't have any information, really, we have a very uninformative decision boundary. Now, in the bottom panel here, we also have a bunch of unlabeled examples. And by sharing statistical structure across the labeled and unlabeled examples, we're able to generate a much more informative decision boundary, which should help us make much better predictions. Now, in order to modify this approach for semi-supervised learning, uh, this looks like, you know, uh, sort of a, a lot of math, but it's really quite simple. Uh, we just uh, modify the discriminator so that instead of outputting a single number between zero and one, it outputs a vector of k plus one different probabilities representing um, the probability that its input has come from any one of the k plus one classes in a k class classification problem where we have an additional class to represent from the generator or not from the generator. And so uh, from the perspective of the generator, it just wants to fool the discriminator into thinking that its samples come from one of the k real classes. So say one of the digit values that we're trying to classify. Um, and from the discriminator perspective, it wants to correctly label the examples that actually have specific labels, like this is a seven, or this is a nine, or this is a four. Um, and otherwise, it just wants to differentiate between samples from the generator versus uh, unlabeled real samples, like before. So if you did MAP on this, do you get hypocans? Uh, no. <laughs> Good question. Um, OK. So uh, once we've uh, followed this sampling procedure of iteratively sampling from these conditional posteriors, uh, we want to marginalize. Uh, uh, this distribution over the discriminator weight. So this is just a simple Bayesian model average. Uh, it would apply to, to essentially any model. Uh, so here we have the predictive distribution of our convolutional neural network, which we're using for our discriminator, given its parameters, weighted by the posterior probability of those parameters, given our data. Um, and uh, um, this is exactly the same sort of equation that we saw uh, uh, when we were talking about uh, a Bayesian treatment of, of same mixtures of Gaussians. Okay, so um, in order to actually sample effectively from these um, proposed conditional posterior distributions, we used an algorithm called stochastic gradient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is a, a relatively old uh, MC and auxiliary variable MCMC approach which at a high level allows you to use gradient information to make better proposals. Um, stochastic gradient HMC is a way of, of using HMC um, essentially with mini batches of data, so you don't need the whole sort of training set on each iteration. Um, algorithmically, it actually very highly re resembles um, just plain stochastic gradient, momentum-based stochastic gradient descent with noise. And so, um, you know, in a way that's, that's a little bit sad, uh, in another sense, it's actually very exciting because it means that whenever we're using SGD to train a deep neural network, we can also use SGHMC and follow a fully Bayesian approach. And all of the empirical intuitions that we've gained in being able to successfully use SGD 
in deep learning applications will directly translate into using SGHMC. And it doesn't just stop at SGHMC. I mean, we tried things like Atom HMC and other things, other sort of ways to modify this algorithm, and we find that we can still see sort of pretty big improvements. Um, but in addition to sort of the efficiency, uh, sort of computational efficiency that can come from using many batches of, of data to train these, these algorithms, um, we also find in, in, in neural networks that we also uh, often get better solutions. So um, Jorge Nosedal gave a talk at, at Cornell a few months ago um, where he argues that um, SGD would typically converge to very broad local optima, whereas um, batch gradient methods, uh, LBFGS, et cetera, would tend to converge to sharper local optima. And this sort of makes sense because uh, in, in SGD, we have a mini batch of data. Each time the gradients will be more consistent, we'll converge to some sort of broader local optima here and a sharper local optima here. Um, sometimes this might actually be a better or similar local optima, but the solutions that we get uh, on the test set are often much worse when we use, say, these parameters versus these parameters. And this also makes sense. It, um, you know, we have to be a, a lot... Uh, more sort of well calibrated when we use these kinds of local optima. If we were to add just maybe a couple dozen more training points, maybe the position of this optima would shift somewhere else. Uh, so we might be sort of you know, outside of this area and not have a very good solution anymore, whereas all of these solutions are somewhat reasonable. Um, so this is exciting from a Bayesian perspective because it means that um, you know, even if we're using a, quite a vague prior, uh, we'll get quite a different answer than if we were to represent, say, this whole posterior distribution using a point mass. Uh, moreover, um, uh, if we're using an algorithm like stochastic gradient HMC, we'll also typically be sampling in the vicinity of these fairly broad local optima. And moreover, each of these solutions, each of these settings of the weights, while they're giving similarly good answers, they're actually very meaningfully different representations for the data. So doing a Bayesian model average will actually be very effective in these situations. So this is why, in general, I'm very excited about Bayesian deep learning. OK, so um, uh, I don't expect you to parse everything on this slide, but this is the algorithm that we, we use for training the Bayesian GAN. And the main point here is that algorithmically, it's actually very similar to momentum-based SGD plus noise. And the noise has a, has a sort of a special kind of variance such that asymptotically we'll be sampling from the right stationary distribution. OK, so now we can finally understand this, this figure. Uh, so here uh, in the top row, we have um, Samples from six different, or six different generators, which have been sampled from our posterior over generators on the MNIST training set. And then with each of those generators, we've sampled 16 different, different images. And we can see that between these panels, between these generators, we have very different qualitative properties. So some of these might be uh, corresponding to fairly sort of uh, 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 different writing utensils. We have fairly thick digits here. Others have different writing styles, et cetera, such that, that each generator corresponds to an interpretably, interpretably different generative hypothesis for our observations. Um, whereas in the bottom row here, we've just trained the, the DC GAN six different times. And we see that though the samples uh, don't look too bad, I mean, their fidelity is probably even better than the samples up here, um, they're, they're really homogenous. There isn't a lot of variability um, in these samples. And, and, and in fact, these samples are actually missing important properties of the data distribution. Now, we wouldn't necessarily actually expect an arbitrary sample from the posterior generators to be better than the generator that you would get using the classical DC GAN. In fact, we showed that, that this generator would correspond to one of the modes of this distribution. And of course, uh, if we had to bet everything on one solution, we might go with the mode rather than something that could potentially be sampled in the tails of this distribution. However, by, by um, storing all of these solutions, alongside their posterior probabilities, we can actually do very effective semi-supervised learning. Here we have another example. In the uh, far left column, we have samples from a multimodal distribution. In this middle column here, we have samples from uh, the classical GAN as it proceeds through training. Eventually, it does collapse onto one of the modes. Here we have samples from the Bayesian GAN. Um, and very quickly, it's, it's, it's quite effectively sampling from this multimodal distribution without any of the tricks that are normally used to actually train GAN, so feature matching, um, label smoothing, et cetera. Um, 
Here we also have the, the empirical Jensen-Shannon divergence between the true distribution in this case and the uh, induced distributions for the classical GAN, uh, which we're here calling the maximum likelihood GAN and the, the Bayesian GAN. And again, the, the Bayesian GAN converges to the true distribution very quickly. Uh, we also see this interesting behavior in the classical GAN where, in fact, uh, the, it goes, the Jensen-Shannon divergence goes down, lower is better here, and then it spikes up, uh, which is sort of reminiscent of overfitting. Um, here, we wanted to show that there, you know, we weren't just um, getting multimodality in the observed data space, but we also had multimodality in the parameter space. So in order to test that, we took our samples from the generator weights and visualized them in two dimensions using multidimensional scaling, and we saw a lot of very distinct clusters. So that meant it actually was really important, for example, to be doing MCMC versus maybe a vanilla, say, variational approach to inference where, uh, you know, we might have some distribution that looks like this, and we're actually just modeling it with, you know, a unimodal Gaussian or something like that centered at one of these modes. Uh, it really mattered to be exploring this whole distribution. Okay, so we're almost done. Uh, we um, uh, looked also at the accuracy of this approach as a function of training time, and again, it converged quite quickly. This is in comparison to a fully supervised method on the MNIST data set, so after uh, uh, you know, about uh, half an hour of training and only uh, less than 1% of the, the, the tra training labels, uh, we were getting really state-of-the-art performance, so 99% accuracy, which is what you know, uh, a state-of-the-art comp net would get using all of the training examples. So it's kind of interesting that you can, you can get that level of performance with a very small fraction of, of labeled data. You can really just learn a good representation from the unlabeled examples. Um, and we saw similar results also with SIFAR and a number of other data sets. Um, in this table, we compared to a bunch of other approaches, so a bunch of other um, GAN variants, uh, which we modified so that they would do semi-supervised learning in a similar way. And also we compared to uh, uh, fully supervised models on, on many of these benchmarks. Um, notably, the, the Bayesian GAN did outperform these other models, including an ensemble of 10 DC GANs. Uh, so in this column, we really did everything possible to try to make the, the, the competing method you know, work really well. So we, we really did a lot of intervention. Here for the Bayesian GAN, we didn't have very much intervention. You know, big priors, uh, none of the tricks that are required to make these things sort of work in practice. Um, we also noticed that uh, just in general, um, there's a pretty big gap between <coughs> Uh, fully supervised learning on these problems and semi-supervised learning. So uh, one way of parsing these, these figures is that the, the light blue curve here corresponds to a fully supervised approach on uh, a number of labeled examples. Uh, the uh, darker blue curve here corresponds to a DCGN, which has been modified uh, to do semi-supervised learning in the way that I described. And the red curve here corresponds to the, the Bayesian GAN. So we see a big gap between uh, fully supervised versus semi-supervised and semi-supervised sort of maximum likelihood style GANs and the Bayesian GAN. And uh, we can also play more with, with sample generation as well, and that's something that we've been looking at actually recently, developing other types of, of probabilistic GANs which would have likelihoods that would in some way be analogous to some of these recent <laughs> GAN variants such as Wasserstein. Again, uh, all of the code is available online, and uh, we'd be very happy for feedback. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we'll just um, hold the questions for the break. Um, we're just kind of intuitively good, but I think we're kind of one. Yeah, let's just say that we take the team and break. Several, first of all, which of these have batteries? This no longer has batteries. 